Good morning, uh, brothers and sisters, friends. Thank you for this um, great opportunity and privilege to speak to this winter school. Um, I was asked to speak about discipling mission, uh, discipleship and mission in the light of COVID-19. And as you've seen, my title is Time to Breathe, Exploring Ways Forward in Discipling Mission. Looking back over the past three years, it's striking how breathing has become prominent. One of the key symptoms of the COVID-19 pandemic has been lung infections that cause breathing problems. Numerous survivors of COVID-19 describe the symptoms as a heavy feeling on the chest, a life and death struggle to breathe. Millions of COVID-19 sufferers had to receive oxygen to remain alive. That echoes the tragic final words of George Floyd, the victim of racist police brutality in the USA, I can't breathe. An oppressive social system like racism literally throttles the life out of you. In many countries, there's presently active military conflict, causing millions of children, women and men to flee their homes and to hide in underground bunkers or refugee camps in another city or country. One can imagine millions of people across the globe feeling we can't breathe. In the Accra Declaration, the suffering of the poor has been closely linked to the suffering of the earth. One can imagine that poverty, unemployment, and ecological degradation are causing the poor, together with endangered animals, dying trees, and polluted rivers, also to say, we can't breathe. The times, the time we're living in is out of breath. It's on this huge canvas of a suffering world, an earth community struggling for breath, that I want to paint a small picture of discipling mission, focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic. Now faced with such a huge challenge, the first temptation is to go too wide and to end up with superficial generalizations. The other temptation is to focus too narrowly and to end up ignoring or downplaying the intersectionality between these destructive forces. Now I'm going to err today on the side of a narrow focus. Um, I reflect missiologically on the pandemic and its effects, asking myself what the discipling mission means in response to it. So my focus is on reading the signs of COVID-19 times as we live in the reality of messianic time. My picture is a fragmented one, not only due to lack of time, but the, the time that I have to speak, but also because I find it increasingly difficult to get a neat, coherent picture of what's going on in South Africa and in the world. And maybe there isn't a neat, coherent picture. There's also no neat, coherent picture of what it means to be Christian and what it means to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ as part of God's mission. Uh, Willie James Jennings in his book After Whiteness also speaks about fragments, that we have fragments, we have little more than fragments, but we must pick them up and try and put them together. So that's what I'm going to try to do, putting a few passages of scriptures together, scripture together, stringing them together on the thread of discipling mission in messianic time. So let me start with Matthew 16 the first three verses of Matthew 16. Um, this section I call reading the signs of the pandemic. Reading the signs of the times refer to a spiritually informed discernment of a particular situation. I'm going to look at a few passages of scripture, stringing them together on the thread of discipling mission in messianic time. And the first passage I'm, I'm looking at is Matthew 16 the first three verses, and I call this section reading the signs of the pandemic. And Matthew 16 reads, the Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it's evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. 
you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Now, reading the signs of the times refers to a spiritually informed discernment of a particular situation, looking at it with prophetic eyes, seeing through to what's really going on. It's based on the words of Jesus to the Pharisees and Sadducees here, who approach him to test him, that is to challenge his authority, or to ex explore the basis of his authority, by asking for a sign from heaven or from the sky. You know how to interpret the, the face, the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. They couldn't discern the nature or urgency of the times. The kai, kairos, kairoi is used here that they were living in. The only sign that would be given them was the sign of Jonah. Cryptic and contestable sign of death and resurrection. So the mystery of each time can only be unlocked if it is discerned through the lens or in the mirror of a crucified Messiah. To quote Kosuke Kuyama, we need a crucified mind, not a crusading mind, to see into what's happening, to, to read the signs of the times. Not a mind looking for quick fix miracles from heaven to answer all our questions or solve all our problems. Emmanuel Kotongole puts it differently. He says certain things can be seen only by eyes that have cried, only by eyes that are shaped by cross and resurrection. In the novel, The Plague by Albert Camus, the Catholic priest, Father Panelou, preached a fiery sermon early on in the, in the plague, in the pandemic, in which he said that the plague was God's punishment for the evils of the town and its shallow piety. But later, when he and the doctor in the novel, Dr. Ryu, had witnessed the agonizing death of a young boy due to the plague, he changed. He joined a health team to look after patients. He then preached another sermon with a completely different message. For one thing, he no longer said you to the congregation, but we. And he finally died of the plague himself due to that exposure to the ill. Some things can only be seen and understood by eyes that have cried. Now, if we adopt this epistemic approach, this way of seeing and trying to read, discern the signs, how do we discern the signs of COVID-19 time? What kind of time is this? Is it over? Are we still inside it? Can we put it behind us and move on? Now, there's a medical dimension to this question. The doctors say that the pandemic is over when the virus causing it has become endemic in a community. So a quote from a medical uh, publication, COVID-19 can be defined as endemic when it exists at a predictable level that doesn't require society-defining intervention. And it's like the annual flu in winter, that, that predictable, many people do die of it, but there's, there's, in, there's vaccines for it, and you don't need society-defining interventions. You don't need lockdowns. You don't need everybody to wear masks. It's, it's manageable. It's predictable. Are we there yet? There's also a personal dimension to this question. Some among us who are living with long COVID will struggle with fatigue and other symptoms for months, perhaps years to come. There are people passing away as we speak from having contracted COVID-19. In that sense, the pandemic, pandemic is not yet over, neither in South Africa nor in the rest of the world. We are still in COVID time. So we need to be aware, attentive, careful, get vaccinated and avoid risks. Because COVID time is risk time danger time. We are struggling to breathe. The other personal dimension of COVID-19 time are the traumatic memories from losing relatives, friends, and colleagues, especially during the strong lockdowns, when we were unable to say goodbye to them personally, uh, unable to mourn them or bury them properly in community. 
In that sense, COVID-19 is still with us and will perhaps even be haunting us for a while. COVID time is a time of loss and longing. In that novel, The Plague, the doctor at the end of the, at the novel says, for the mothers, husbands, wives, and lovers who had lost all joy, now that the loved one lay under a, a layer of quicklime in a death pit, for them the plague had not yet ended. All around him, happy faces were turned to the shining sky. Men and women with flushed cheeks embraced one another with low, tense cries of desire. Yes, the plague had ended with a terror. And those passionately straining arms told what it had meant. Exile and deprivation in the profoundest meaning of the words. COVID time is a time of exile and deprivation. We are struggling to breathe. Another dimension of COVID time is the trauma of economic loss through a government lockdown that caused a collapsing economy, loss of income and unemployment for millions across the world. COVID time is a time of financial loss or standstill for most people, but also of huge profit for some, either through the provision of requirements like vaccines, masks, PPEs and sanitizers, or through corrupt officials who cash in opportunist, opportunist, opportunistically, it is, a, it is a dirty, difficult word to say, to siphon off money intended for those people and those needs. COVID time is indeed a time of exile and deprivation. We're struggling to breathe. Another painful dimension of COVID time is the loss of learning time for children and youth at school and university. Many of them were not digitally connected, have been set back by a year or more in their intellectual stimulation and growth. A time of exile and deprivation. Our children are struggling to breathe. Churches have also felt the impact of COVID time. Church attendance for most congregations is not back to pre-COVID levels. Maybe they never will be. As members, we were exiled from our joint worship and fellowship, deprived of precious mutual support. Congregational incomes have dropped and are slowly picking up in many of them. But will we reach pre-COVID levels and go beyond them? If we don't, does this require a revamp of ministry patterns? Will more congregations no longer be able to afford full-time ministers? We're struggling to breathe. There's also a deeper spiritual exile and deprivation that the pandemic has brought about. There's a nagging feeling in the lives of many church members that the sheer scale of the pandemic's destruction challenges our faith in the providence of a caring, protecting God. Where is the brazen confidence of faith that used to cast out demons and claim health and wealth in the name of Jesus? What has happened to us spiritually in the past three years? I think we've moved in different directions. Some have become more deeply devoted Christians through personal reading, meditation, prayer, and online interaction. Others have become more individualistic and self-sufficient, comfortable to stay at home and not return to joint worship. Others have lost faith in God or trust in the church as a meaningful and helpful community to belong to. Dr. Ryu in The Plague of Kami says, for the moment he wished to behave like all the others around him, who believed or made believe that the plague can come and go without changing anything in men's hearts. But the plague always changes something in people's hearts. The pandemic has changed our hearts in some direction or the other, depending on who we are and where we live. COVID time is that kind of time, a time of exile and deprivation. We're struggling to breathe. But now I turn to Romans 13, verses 11 to 14, living in messianic time. I'm going to read it in a moment. The pandemic did not hit us on its own. It came with a number of other disasters and challenges, such as global warming, with more intense heat waves, wildfires, tornadoes, floods, snowfalls. It came together with a number of raging wars. 
on our African continent and in other continents. It came along with increasing hunger, poverty, and inequality across the globe. It came with an increase in cultural, religious, political antagonism, the rise of racism, gender-based violence, and exclusive nationalism. There's a rise of right-wing and left-wing politics across, across the globe. More radicalization, more polarization. All of this creates a dim picture for the future of the world community and for prospects of global peace and global the overcoming of global hunger. It's understandable that many Christians gravitate to a certain kind of apocalyptic, which sees, which sees all of this as signs that the end of the world is near. I don't share that, and you, you'll see that as I go along. What South Africa and the world needs is hope. Not a shallow optimism or an escapist individual insurance policy for the year after. We need a concrete, communal, horizontal hope into and through the challenges that face us. To have hope is to have a clear and liberating sense of time to breathe messianic time. And the Apostle Paul expressed this in many passages, but one of the clearest, as I said, is Romans 13, 11 to 14. And he, 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 he wrote, besides this, you know what time it is. Now it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. And I'm using the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version here. Verse 12, the night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I read only thus far. The night is far gone. The day is near, the apostle says. Now to say that in the middle of the first century, to small groups of Christians living in the belly of the beast, the capital of the Roman Empire, was brave and countercultural. The apostle calls on them not to experience time as measured from the past, as the Romans Proud, proudly said, Ab urbe condita, from the foundation of this famous city. But to measure and experience time from the future, from the day of God that is dawning. The cross and the resurrection of Christ has brought about the new creation in which, believer, in which believers live now. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 is well known. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The new creation arrives to make this time, what makes this time messianic is that it's not a linear progression like on a calendar. It is fulfilled time, pregnant time, if you like, time qualified by the presence of the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit. Do not be conformed to this age, Paul says in Romans 12, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This age this time is passing and a new time is present, has arrived, is arriving, will arrive. It infects this, the messianic age is not a new period that will start after this world has ended. It intersects with this age of death and suffering of the flesh, of that selfish, greedy, self-affirmation and violence. And the messianic age infuses this age even this COVID age, with an unstoppable hope, the energy to move forward, to live and share the good news of God's love and justice, the victory of God over hatred, injustice, exclusion, exploitation, abuse. It means moving from darkness into light, the apostle said, into the dawning new day. How does messianic time impact COVID time, well, it reorients us, changes our direction, it changes our whole view of time and of space and of life. 
Some years ago, I was in a high building in the center of Pretoria for a meeting. And as I looked out of the window, I saw the Queen Street Mosque on the street level below. And you know, mosques are not built according to how, but the streets, the streets are designed. They, they face Mecca, Qibla, the, the prayer direction Muslims. And so here's this building in the middle of this huge city with its huge buildings and it's out of shape. It doesn't face like all the other buildings. And Muslims thereby are constantly reminded that they must not be conformed to the values of the surrounding culture. They need to orientate themselves to Mecca and build their lives around that vision, that compelling vision. It's the same with us Christians. We do not fit in to this age, we belong to the messianic age. We do not live like this, we live like this. And messianic time reorients us to that vision, to that way of life. But where do we face as Christians when we pray? Where is our Qibla, to use the Islamic term? For me, the apostle says we face the dawning day of God. We face the future. We look to the risen and glorified Christ at the right hand of the Father, who is the bright morning star, showing us where the sun will rise and assuring us that the sun will rise. The bright morning star, and we move towards him as we work and pray our way into the future. So that fundamentally alters our sense of time. We're not dominated by the tyranny of capital time, capitalist time, that linear time of unending progress that, that crushes people in, in, in its path. In that linear time where time is money, we are set free from the tyranny of that time. In worship, personal and communal worship, our minds are transformed to live in messianic time, to be shaped by the sign of Jonah, by the logic of sacrificial love and compassionate justice. It's officially baptism and the Lord's Supper that synchronize us with messianic time, rebooting our computers, transforming our minds to live messianically in the midst of empire time and in the midst of COVID time. And so how does concretely messianic time impact COVID time? Let me start with, with death, the fear of death and the and mourning of a loved one. We tend to view human life as mirrored in the course of a day. When we're born, it's sunrise. When we're in the prime of life, it's midday, noon. And when we're close to dying, it is evening. It's understandable and helpful to see human life in this way. But that's not a messianic way of living and dying. When we live messianically, we are living towards the day, into the light. And when we die messianically, we step over into the, the light. That's not to deny the pain of separation that death brings and the loss, the feeling of loss, but it enables us not to mourn like those without hope as the same apostle says in 1 Thessalonians 4. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So we've lost so many people and we, are, we have lost so much in so many ways. But messianic time impacts COVID time by saying to us, we can step over into the light. We step over into the light when we die. We're living towards light, shoulder to shoulder. We're stumbling deeper and deeper into the light towards the dawn. But how does messianic um, time impact our view of mission? It means that we're not the ones who have the light and are taking it to those in darkness. We are the ones who are waking up from sleep. We are the ones who are turning away from darkness to put on the armor of light as we move into the dawning day of God. And on our way, we call on others to wake up from darkness, from our shared darkness as humanity, not their darkness. 
We live honorably and justly as in the day, the apostle says, not as if we are in the day, pretending or trying or make believe, but actually living the life of the dawning day now in this these earth, early hours of the morning. It's not five minutes to 12, as the doom prophets of doom keep on telling us. It's perhaps rather 12 minutes to five in the morning, in the early dawn, as we live in the light that live the life of the day while it is still dawn. We're living God's future now with our faces to the dawn. That's what mission means if we live messianically. It means that we're not addicted, as the, Apo the Apostle Paul says, we're not addicted to substances. We're not enslaved to our sexual desires. We're not dominated by jealousy, greed, and factionalism. We're not captured by the idols of race nation or culture and that we work as hard as we can to wake up fully from this darkness to turn away from all the vestiges of this darkness in us in our congregations our neighborhoods our cities our provinces our country our continent this is the never ending task of re-evangelizing the church which is part of messianic mission waking up ourselves and all God's sleeping people into living messianically, living in messianic time. And as we do that in the half darkness of dawn, as we live this daybreak ethos, as someone has called it, we discover that there are others who are living messianically around us who don't share our theology or liturgy, but to do confess Jesus as Messiah with us. Messianic mission means reaching out to everyone who names the name of Jesus, to learn from them and with them what it means to wake up from darkness and to live in the light. It means walking and working shoulder to shoulder with them in the name of Jesus Messiah. In this half darkness of the dawn, we also discover others who are captured by darkness, have been overwhelmed by COVID time and its after effects, or who are trapped in addictions, have been drawn into gangs and other negative forms of life that perpetuate violence. Messianic mission means preaching the gospel as a liberating force to set people free from the guilt and the power of sin. We may never give up, we must never give up our calling to evangelize, provided we acknowledge that in the same act, we are re-evangelizing ourselves as we grow together with others into the light. In the half darkness of the dawn, we also discover others living messianically around us but to, but to do not share our faith in Jesus as Messiah. There are many of them, NGOs, faith-based organizations, individuals, who even go before us in doing God's will in the community. Doing mission messianically also means joining them to bring the day of God closer without denying Jesus as Messiah or compromising our love for him as our bright morning star. And now we move to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29 to 31. I call this having as not having. So the apostle explains this messianic time um, even more clearly in, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no possessions. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now this can be badly misunderstood and has been badly misunderstood as a negative and world-denying spirituality. But it can also be understood in a liberating way. It breathes the same daybreak ethos as the other passages I've read from Paul. It also helps us to see more clearly the radical nature of messianic time. We must not make the mistake of saying that this was the understandable but mistaken urgency of the early church and that we should get over it to settle down into a more comfortable and regular existence. 
We have here a powerful resource to help us overcome one of our greatest challenges in waking up ourselves and our congregations for messianic mission, our captivity to greed. We own so many things. And the more we own, the more we are owned. The more we possess, the more we are possessed. If we can learn to live messianically in these early hours of the morning, we can learn not to live with grabbing hands, controlled by greedy money, as Hinkelamert and Dukhrov has written in that book, Overcoming Greedy Money, nor to regard possessions, on the other hand, as worthless or irrelevant, to have as not having, to buy as, as not buying, is not make believe or pretense. It's a distinct way of life that holds onto things with flat, open palms, knowing that they can so easily be lost. It also means not allowing ourselves to be defined by what we have. I own, therefore I am. I am white, therefore I am. I have a degree, therefore I am. I shop, therefore I am. No, I am loved, therefore we are. We are named, therefore we are. Not this land belongs to me, but we belong to this land. It means living life, all of life, as a gift. It means rediscovering the Sermon on the Mount and a large part of the New Testament that we seem to have written off as the crazy, overexcited beliefs of the, of the early Christians, which we have fortunately graduated from. Next passage that I want to refer to is Matthew, 5, Matthew 13, verses 51 to 53. And I call it Discipled for Mission. Uh, at the end of a long chapter of parables arranged by the author of Matthew's gospel as a third block of teaching by Jesus, the Lord asked his disciples, have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. That's again the NRSV. Now, the Greek phrase translated here as trained, because every scribe trained for the kingdom of heaven, can be translated as discipled for the kingdom of heaven. The verb used here, matiteo, to disciple, is also used in Matthew 28. Uh, in the rest of the gospel, it's the noun, disciples, that is used. So the purpose of Jesus' whole ministry, his telling of stories, his healings, his eating with the people, his traveling through Galilee and Samaria, his going to Judea, going to the cross, was for people to be discipled for the coming reign of God, for the Basileia, the kingdom of heaven, as it's called here, that force field of God's love and grace promised for the end of time to shape everything they think, say, and do. It means to be oriented to the future, very much, very similar to the, to the Apostle Paul's messianic time. Jesus' messianic time and, and Paul's messianic time were identical, except that the one was before the cross and the other one was after the cross. It's living forward, not evading the challenges or escaping from the world into spiritual safety, but living hopefully in the midst of trouble, danger, and suffering with God's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. That is what mission is about. Christ himself drawing us into this hopeful existence with him in his company as a community of believers. And he does that by firing up our imagination, by telling us stories, and then by checking that we understand them. Have you understood all this? They answered yes. Did they? Did the first disciples understand all of that? The verb understand here is in the perfect tense. Have you, have you understood it? Meaning this understanding is meant to be a lasting, ongoing reality, not a passing event that you leave behind. So this is discipleship. A basic orientation, a firm disposition, a set of habits, 
a way of life oriented towards God's future in the company of God's Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Did the first disciples understand all that? Perhaps they did. But Jesus continues immediately with the final short parable to hit the nail in, to reinforce it. This, and this parable is not about the kingdom of heaven as the previous ones in, in chapter 13, but about what the scribe looks like who has been discipled for the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 52 says, he is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Now, this is a male image, since the one over the house, in Greek, oikodespotes or oikonomos, who carried the key to the storeroom in that culture, was usually a man. So we now need, in interpreting it, to expand this image to include the women who, who fill the pantry by growing the food or buying the food quite often, and who usually cook the food. But the point here is clearly to lead to take responsibility for a community, which is viewed as a connected household. Someone discipled for the reign of God, the commonwealth of freedom that is coming, that is busy coming, that is here in, in the presence of Jesus, is, is, uh, takes responsibility for a household, views community as a household, and therefore leads by serving the common good. What is a scribe? student of scripture who has become discipled for God's future look like? Someone who feeds a household. It's about eating. Make sure that there's enough in the storeroom for everyone to eat. To distribute to each according to their need. Make sure that no one goes to bed hungry. Who welcomes visitors and strangers. It's not the image of the householder that we find in another parable in Luke 12, verse 42. 46 where that householder spends the goods of the household in parties with friends so that the members of the household go hungry and then beats them up when they complain messianic mission for which jesus and into which the lord jesus disciples us is to view society as god's household a caring and connected community and then to live as committed and caring members of that household sharing its resources with the whole household, the whole oikos. How does this impact, this messianic time, impact on COVID time? I referred already to the Accra Declaration that unmasked the uncomfortable reality of Christians who are comfortable with global liberal capitalism. It unmasks us as this evil and selfish householder who beats up and exploits other members of the household, that's economy, while exploiting and degrading the earth, ecology, wasting, eating up, messing up the unrenewable resources of the earth, at the, which is the very basis of our life together. To live and do mess, mission messianically, to learn how to be good caretakers, stewards, members of the earth community. So let me conclude my fragments that I've strung up on this idea of messianic mission and messianic time. Um, I highlighted a few dimensions of discipling mission and tried to read the signs of COVID time and, and show how messianic time can impact on COVID time and help us to start breathing again. But I want to close with um, a few short quotes from that, that novel, The Play by Albert Camus. At the end of the novel, while describing the joyous responses of the town's inhabitants to the lifting of the lockdown, the narrator gives the reasons why he wrote the memoir, his experiences of, of that, that plague. In the midst of the shouts, Dr. Ryu resolved to compile this chronicle so that he should not be one of those who hold their peace, but should be a witness in favor of those plague-stricken people so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done to them might endure. Nonetheless, he knew that the tale he had to tell could not be one of a final victory. It could only be the record of what had to be done, what surely would have to be done again in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless on personal 
three healers. As we, we witness messianically to COVID-19 in South Africa today, let us identify with the people described here who did what had to be done in the never-ending fight against terror and its relentless onslaughts, despite the personal afflictions they had themselves, who, unable to be saints, refused to bow down to pestilences, striving to their utmost to be healers. Thank you and God bless you.